Hello dear students, welcome to EPG Parchala. I am Dr. Savita Kaushal from Newport, Delhi. This module is on scenario of teacher education in ancient and medieval India. Objectives of this module are introduction to historical development of teacher education in India, teaching methods adopted in Vedic, Buddhist and medieval period, role of teacher in Vedic, Buddhist and medieval period. You will be surprised to know that tradition of teacher education in India is very old and it is evident that it was prevalent in Vedic period. This module is concerned with description and explanation of position of teacher and also the teaching methodology particularly during Vedic period. Buddhist period and medieval period. Now, let us discuss these periods one by one. First of all, let us examine the information pertaining to the Vedic period. In the Vedic period, the words shiksha and adhyapana were used for education which means to learn to recite. In Vedic period, education consisted of learning to recite the holy text. The word adhyapana which literally means to go near implies the idea of pupil going to some teacher for education. The ancient Indian education emerged from the Vedas. During this period, education was divided into two kinds of knowledge this worldly and the other worldly. This worldly education dealt with the social aspect, whereas the other worldly education was related to the intellectual pursuits for achieving salvation. The basis of Indian culture lies in the Vedas, which were four in number that is Rig Veda, Samveda, Jajur Veda and Athar Veda. Now, let us see what were the main aims and objectives of the Vedic education. The main objective of Vedic education was the development of physical, moral or spiritual and also intellectual powers of man and to achieve salvation through it. In the field of salvation, much emphasis was laid on attention, concentration and yoga. And the ancient Indians believed that education should prepare an individual in such a way as to prepare him to attain the objectives of liberation that is to be one with the almighty and to be free from the cycle of births and deaths. Education for the future existence was blended in due proportion to achieve spiritual elevation. Preservation and transmission of ancient Indian culture was one of the aims of ancient educational system. Renowned and devoted teachers were engaged in teaching work. Education for the future existence was blended with it in due proportion. In this system, students practiced education independently and this helped them in the upliftment of their future life. A section of Brahmin had to devote the whole of their life to the cause of learning. It was felt that mere intellect was not of worth if the person was devoid of not much morality. Morality or the right behavior was a higher dharma. Education was regarded as a means of inculcating values such as strict obedience to elders, truthfulness, honesty and self-control. Gurukula were established with the aim of character formation. Ample opportunities were provided to the pupils for the multidimensional development of their personality. They had their own methods of work in order to achieve it. Ancient Indians believed that personality should be developed through education. Personality was developed through the following methods that is number one self restraints number 2 self confidence number 3 self respect number 4 discrimination and judgment now regarding the promotion of social efficiency and welfare the promotion of social efficiency and welfare was an equally important aim of education society had accepted the theory of division of work which was later on governed by the principle of heredity 
each family trained its children in its own profession. The purpose was to make each individual of society efficient. Let us now see what the evaluation system at that time was. There seems to be no direct reference available to spell out the methodology followed by the Acharya to judge the adequacy of knowledge of his pupils. The students were given three grades, these are as follows that is Maha Prasnan grade. This was given to the students of very high ability. Then Madhma Prasnan grade, now this was given to students of high ability. And the third one was Alpa Prasnan grade, now this was given to the students of low ability. Regarding the education of women, it is very interesting to know that uh, the Vedas gave a very honorable and respectable status to women. They were eligible for higher education, for the study of Vedas and the performance of administrative and other important jobs mostly performed by men even today. Now, regarding the role of mother in education, during the Vedic period it was felt that a mother should impart education to her children so as to broaden their horizon. At this stage, good manners are to be taught so that the children behave properly with the elders and in assemblies. Now, regarding the autonomy of educational institutions, let us see what was the implication at that time. Teachers in the Vedic period were autonomous in their work and they followed various methods of admission and also assessment. A teacher was the sole pedagogic authority to decide whether the student was fit for admission and also to decide whether he had completed his studies. Now, regarding the studentship, there is a long hymn in the Atharva Veda describing the ceremony pertaining to studentship. The initiation ceremony was called Upanena, which lasted three days. It was quite long. It laid down the foundation of planned life. The pupil owed his first birth that is physical to his parents and the second birth that is spiritual to his teacher. The rite of Upanayana was meant to purify body and mind and to make one fit for receiving education. After Upanayana, the pupil entered into a state that is that state is called Brahmacharya. State of Brahm Brahmacharya indicated that it was a mode of life and it was a system of education. Now, regarding the free education in ancient India, teaching was considered to be a holy duty which a Brahman was bound to discharge. Irrespective of the consideration of the fee, teachers were expected to devote their lives to the cause of teaching in the missionary spirit of self-sacrifice and the society laid down the principle that both the public and the state should help the learned teachers and educational institutions very liberally. Society realized that Vidya Dana or the gift in the cause of education was to be the best of gifts possessing a higher religious merit than even the gift of land. On the occasion of religious feats, students and teachers were invited and donations were given liberally. There was no strict control on education at that time. Rulers of the country had very little directly to do with the education. It was a private affair of the people managed entirely by the Brahmins. So, it is quite interesting to know that it was entirely managed by the caste that is Brahmins. High status of the teacher, there was uh, the teachers were highly honored class and honored by even by the kings. Kings rose from thrones to receive great teachers. And uh, regarding the role of teachers as parents, the teachers behaved as parents to their pupils and pupils behaved as members of the teacher's family. The attitude of the pupil was to be one of complete submission. As the pupils were residing in the house of the gurus, they were begging alms for their own subsistence and also for their guru that is a perceptor. This practice of begging alms by the pupils was to inculcate in them the noble sentiment of humanitarian virtues. The motive behind this system was to sublimate ego in the pupils, which enabled them to face the realities of the life and helped 
in social integration. There were residential schools at that time, so teachers and pupils lived together, so that they, they identified themselves with one another. The pupils resided in the teacher's house and this helped them to develop social contexts. It was considered a sacred duty on the part of the pupils to collect fuel wood, supply water and do other household jobs or jobs also for the teacher. In this way, the pupils were receiving instructions relating to domestic life and also learning the concrete lesson of the dignity of labor and also social service. Besides the pupil of ancient India were receiving valuable training in the occupations of animal husbandry, agriculture, dairy farming by grazing the cows of the guru and serving him in various ways. So, regarding the immediate aim, the immediate aim of education however was to prepare the different caste of people for their actual needs of life. In this system of education, emphasis was given not only on book learning and providing basic knowledge, but on application of knowledge to everyday life. So, the scope of education was very comprehensive and wide. For the development of vocational efficiency, healthy, positive attitude and dignity of labor were fostered in pupils since the very beginning of their study. They were trained to earn their living according to their own abilities and powers. Regarding the curriculum, the subjects of instruction varied according to the vocational needs of the different castes from the Vedas and Vedangas in case of Brahmins to the art of warfare in case of Kshatriyas and to agriculture and trade, art and crafts in case of Vaishyas. Regarding the methods of instruction in Vedic education, let us see what it was. The method of instruction generally consisted of recitation by the teachers and repetition by the pupils, followed by explanation by the teacher, questioning by the pupil and discussion between the teacher and the pupil. Debates, discussions, storytelling was also adopted according to the need. Teachers at that time, they were regarded as spiritual as well as intellectual guide and teacher also occupied a pivotal position in Vedic system of education. The teacher was a facilitator of learning and above all a religious and a spiritual guide. Teacher was a spiritual father of his pupil. In addition to imparting intellectual knowledge to them, he was also morally responsible. He was always to keep a guard over the conduct of his pupils. During the Vedic period, learning was transmitted orally from one generation to another. Great importance was attached to the proper ascent and also to the pronunciation in the Vedic recitation and these could be correctly learnt only from a properly qualified teacher. The spiritual solution depended almost entirely upon the proper guidance of a competent teacher. Now, let us examine what were the processes of instruction at that time. There were three steps in instruction at that time, that is sravana. Sravana meant listening to the word text as they were uttered by the teacher. Then second one was manana, that is the process of deliberation or reflection of the topic taught. And the third one was nidhyasana that represents the highest stage and it is higher than the manana. Regarding the role of travel in education, it was felt at that time that travel was necessary for education and it was uh, given lot of importance and uh, regarding Sanskrit as a medium of instruction as these education institutions were managed and organized by the Brahmins and all the books were written in Sanskrit, therefore the medium of instruction was Sanskrit. And regarding the self control and discipline, it was given a lot of importance. Self discipline was considered to be the best form of discipline. However, corporal punishment was not altogether ruled out. You will be surprised to know that there was a widespread education of women at that time. In the earlier Vedic period, girls were free to 
go through the Upanayana ceremony which we already mentioned previously in our text and live in a life of celibacy. They also studied the Vedas, Vedangas and other subjects along with their brother pupils. Regarding the duration of education, it was in the house of teacher the students were required to obtain education up to the age of 24 years, after which he or she was expected to enter domestic life. Students were divided into three categories. Number one, those obtaining education up to the age of 24 years, that is Vasu. Those obtaining education up to the age of 36 years, Rudra. Those obtaining education up to the age of 48 years, that is Aditya. Now, regarding the forms of education in Vedic period, there were three types of institutions. Number one, Gurukulas, number two, Parishads and number three, Sammelan. Regarding the teacher education in Vedic period, that is Rig Vedic specifically and even in the Sutra age, there were no formal teacher training colleges. A teacher was successful and excellent student, one who was already first taught by his own master. He further increased his knowledge and later on acknowledged by the learner society to become a teacher. So, basically it was a role of the society, learner society which identified a person to become a teacher. In the Apstambhagriya Sutra, it is uh, reported that there were persons teaching each other different redactions of Vedas. This was a way in which teacher increased their knowledge. The Buddhayana uh, Griha Sutra also informs that one of the hopes expressed at the convocation or Samvartana was that the graduates may have the good luck of attracting students from all quarters. No formal training was considered necessary for the teaching profession. A number of times during the course, the students got opportunity to go through the learned debates, which were also known as Shastrartha and which would later also develop fame of scholarship as a teacher. By the epic age, the hermitages and the learned gatherings at the time of sacrifices also became a source of teacher education. So, these were varied kind of sources of teacher education that is Shastrartha and also learned gathering at the time of uh, sacrifices. The hermitages have also been reported in Mahabharata. There were also concourses of learned men at the courts of the king during gatherings for important sacrifices. Those who took part in such meetings were teachers. The teachers as a result received valuable knowledge and learning and they included them in their syllabus while teaching students. These means of teacher education continued till the Buddhist period. Now, let us examine teacher education in Buddhist period. During the Buddhist period, monasteries were the centers of education. Besides monasteries, there was no other organization for imparting education. Only the Buddhist could receive religious and the other type of education at that time. Other persons were deprived of this facility. There was no place for yajna. Buddhist education was based on the teachings of Gautam Buddha. These teachings were so important that they remained a source of inspiration for individual as well as the social development in India. The influence of Buddhist teachings cannot be undermined even during the later period. The chief aim of Buddhist education was all round development of child's personality. This included his physical, mental, moral and intellectual development. During this period, in the organization of education, special emphasis was laid on formation of character of the students. Student life was hard and rigorous. They observed celibacy. Regarding the religious education, like the Vedic period, religion was given top priority and education was imparted through it. Regarding the preparation for life, in this system of education, there was a provision for imparting worldly and practical knowledge along with the religious education, so that when the students enter normal life, they may be able to earn their livelihood. Pabja was an accepted ceremony of the Buddhist monasteries. Pabja means going out. According to this ceremony, the students after being admitted to a monastery had to renounce all his worldly and family relationships. 
an individual belonging to any caste could be admitted to monastery and after being admitted he did not belong to any caste. For Pabja ceremony the individual had to get his head fully shaved and put on yellow cloths. In this shape he was presented before the presiding bhikshu. On presentation this individual would pray for admission to the monastery. The aspirant for admission used to pronounce these advices very distinctly. Then his admission was permitted. On being admitted, the individual was called Sharman. Uh, after Pabja, the Buddhist monk had to undergo the Upasampada ceremony. This ceremony was different from Pabja ceremony. It was after receiving education for 12 years that it is at the age of 20 years. So, Upasampada ceremony was performed and regarding the responsibility of teacher, both the teacher and the students were responsible to the monastery or the Buddhist order. But regarding education, cloths, food and residence of the student, monk, the teacher was wholly responsible. The teacher was also responsible for any treatment of the student wherever he fell ill. The teacher used to bestow all affection to his student and used to educate him through lecture and question answer method. Now regarding the curriculum, the curriculum was chiefly spiritual in nature. It was because the chief aim of education was to attain salvation. So the study of the religious books was most important. This type of curriculum was meant only for the monks. Besides these, spinning, weaving, printing of the cloths, tailoring, sketching, accountancy, medicines, surgery and coinage were the other subjects of Buddhist education. So you must be amazed to listen, so many subjects were there at that time. Regarding the methods of teaching, Buddhist education aimed at purity of character. Like Vedic education, it was training for moral character rather than the psychological development of the students. One has to attain the stage of bodhisattva and mental and moral development was emphasized at that time. Though the art of writing had been developed at that time up to the Buddhist period, yet due to shortage and non-availability of writing materials, verbal education was prevalent as it was in the Vedic age. The teacher used to give lessons to the novices who learned them by heart. The teacher used to put questions on learning the lesson by heart. If there was lot of emphasis on discussion at that time in order to win discussion on Shastartha and impress the general public. It was necessary to improve the power of discussion. This was also needed to satisfy the critics and opposing groups and establish one's own cult. These rules were framed for discussion. Regarding the prominence of logic, there was lot of importance for discussion and the, this encouraged the logic in the Buddhist period. The controversial matters could not be decided without logical argument. Logic was also useful in the development of mental power and also knowledge. You will be surprised to know that due to importance given to conferences and tools at that time, these were the chief methods. Another important method was meditation in solitude. That was also quite important. Regarding the women's education, women education during the Buddhist period was at its lowest at the, as the women folk were despised in the sense that Lord Buddha had regarded them as the source of all evils. So he had advised during his period, he regarded them as uh, the source of evil. So he, he had advised during his lifetime not to admit women in monasteries. But after some time, due to the insistence of his dear pupil, his name was Anand, Buddha had to admit uh, about 500 women along with his stepmother for admission in Vihars with many restrictions and also reservations. Regarding vocational education, vocational education was not ignored during the Buddhist system of education. The monks of Vihar were taught spinning, weaving and swing in order that they meet their clothing requirement. They were taught architecture as well. Education in architecture enabled them to build up new Vihars or repair the old ones. Similarly, the householders 
following Buddhism, but living outside Viharas were given training in different type of and also earn their livelihood. Regarding the role of teachers in Buddhist education system, let us see what it was. Bhikshus were the teachers at the Buddhist Viharas and also at the monasteries. They have their own methods of imitation and also training for the apprentices. The preceptor was given a disciple and all possible intellectual and spiritual help and guidance was given by the preceptor to the disciple. There was mutual esteem between the teacher and the pupil. Their relations were like father and son. The teacher was regarded as spiritual father or intellectual father of the student. During the Buddhist period, the place of teacher in the scheme of education was very important. Students in Buddhist education system, let us see what was their situation. The Buddhist system like the Brahminical enjoined upon the pupil the duty of serving the teacher as a part of education. There were also rules for the expulsion of pupil by his teacher. In the five cases of Siddhi Viharika ought to be turned away when he does not feel affection for his Upajya nor great inclination towards him, nor much shame, nor great reverence, nor great devotion. So, these were the uh, rules that were being followed at that time. Now, let us examine the teacher education in medieval period. Uh, during the, the period under review in this uh, text, it covers the system of education in India from about 10th century AD to middle of 18th century, that is uh, before the British rule. The development of the teacher education during the medieval period can be divided into two broad categories that is the Hindu education system and education system during the Muslim period. Aims and objectives of the education at that time were that is development of uh, love for Muslim culture and uh, religion, enabling the individual for Islamic life and preparing the students for the next world, equipping the students for evocation, preparing individuals for running the administration. You will be surprised to know at that time education got the patronages of the rulers. The rulers helped in the spread of education. They built educational institutions and also universities. They endowed them with the funds. Big landlords also provided financial help for the spread of education. The rulers patronized the men of learning. One important uh, point to note was that there was no state control on education at that time. The rulers neither claimed any authority over the education institutions nor interfered with their management. Now, regarding the features, let us see what they were. The education was religion uh, dominated at that time. The pupils acquired knowledge as a religious obligation. By and large, education institutions flourished in the countryside. Regarding the provision of various disciplines, Though education was primarily religion oriented, it included the study of many intellectual activities like mathematics, astronomy, and then also grammar, polity and politics. Art and literature were also encouraged. Regarding the norms of conduct, adequate stress was laid on well defined norms of behavior, pattern of thought, building up of personality and character of the pupils. In the Muslim period that the teacher people relationship when we examine it, teachers were respected as during the Brahmanic or the Buddhist period. There was intimate relationship between the teacher and the pupil, although the practice of living with the teacher was not common during the Islamic period. Teachers took to teaching for love of learning and they were quite learned and they were held in high esteem. Regarding the methods of uh, teaching, we see that there were a lot of individual, individualized instructions. Since the number of students with the teacher was limited, he paid individual attention to each student. Regarding the monetary system, although a teacher did not have many pupils to teach, yet still the teacher would take the help of senior and advanced students to teach the younger or the junior. Regarding the discipline, that is the punishments were quite severe at that time, truants and delinquents were caned on their palms and slapped on their faces. A strange mode of punishment was to make the children hold their ears by taking their hands from under their thighs while sitting on their tiptoes. Regarding the forms of education, we could see that there were different types of institutions at that time. That is, primary education was imparted in maktabs 
and secondary and higher education in madrasas. Vocational education was also imparted, that is the provision was also made for vocational, technical and also professional education. The madrasas imparted secondary and higher education, often these madrasas were attracted to most literature, logic, history, geography, astronomy, astrology, arithmetic, agriculture and medicine were the subjects taught in madrasa. Some madrasa had hostels attached to them, which provided free boarding and also lodging. Regarding the Hindu system of education, let us see what was it. Uh, basically, the system of education was by and large at that time dominated by religion. You must have heard about the word Patshala, that is elementary education was imparted in Patshala at that time, uh, which existed both in villages and also in the towns. So, to conclude, we can say that the teachers were adopting a variety of methods of teaching and they were teaching, were adopting variety of teaching methods right from Vedic period to the medieval period. During these periods, the social status of teachers was quite high and they were looked upon by respect. We hope that you enjoyed this module. Thank you.